So welcome uh, and uh, to this very special edition of a chat with Chair uh, today. We have a very unique uh, person with us, Mr. Raj Menda, uh, who is the uh, corporate chairman of RMZ Corp. Uh, in fact, it's one of the few companies which has two corporate uh, chairmen uh, there. Um, very unique there. And Mr. Menda, thank you for also being the joint chairman for the FICI Real Estate uh, Committee. Just to begin, and you know, so our viewers actually understand, you know, RMZ, 18 years ago, you started. Uh, what has been your journey and what changes has the pandemic got in here? Okay, so I think uh, putting it simply, uh, Dilip, first of all, thank you. Uh, and thank you for, uh, for, thanks Vicky for having me. I think, you know, uh, 18 years ago, what uh, made us think differently uh, simply started from the fact that me and my brother Manoj, who founded this company, uh, wanted to actually do office development for the onslaught of the uh, oncoming of IT companies that were coming to India. Uh, if you rewind time 18 years ago, not very many people could see this huge wave of tech companies and IT companies coming here. In fact, uh, I, I, you know, there were two themes we worked on. One is we wanted to be an office developer. And secondly, we wanted to uh, you know, develop offices and you know, keep it on our balance sheet, which was again very different because most of the developers who would even construct uh, an office would sell strata. So we, we differentiated ourselves quite simply by wanting to be an office developer uh, uh, with uh, you know, holding on to the office. Now, all my competitor friends who you know, used to advise me, in fact, used to say that, you know, are you sure you wanted to do something like this? Is this the right thing to do? And, you know, you know because you're holding on, uh, putting this equity one way into, into the projects and holding on to it. And today, the same friends of mine turned around and say, I wish I just followed what you did instead of giving you advice. So, you know, we differentiated ourselves from that. Uh, I think we focused on, you know, and one of the key reasons why we wanted to uh, work with these companies was these are all large, you know, Fortune 500 and NASDAQ listed companies who are coming into India. So there's nothing better than having a customer who is paying you rent, you know, is doing good in its business. So uh, why not just follow the follow the big giant? So and, and that's why we just in all the cities we operate in, all our clients are huge multinationals. Um, really, uh, this was a kind of a venture into something which people did not know, and you saw this boom coming. Given this uh, uh, this pandemic and looking at you know what TCS and other IT companies are talking about work from home, uh, you know how impacted uh, currently is the commercial real estate uh, market in India, and you know how does it look currently uh, in India, especially from a medium to long uh, term perspective? Uh, do you see the growth continuing or do you see it changing? You know, if I were to say the next 18 years, what would be this space be like? Sure. So the good part is, you know, the confidence remains, uh, no doubt, uh, with COVID, uh, there have been a few companies which are rethinking about it. But, uh, you know, let me first um, start with the cities which basically are doing the maximum absorption today in terms of the IT, ITS and uh, tech related businesses. So, you know, uh, I think in terms of where the, the whole absorption is happening, I think it's uh, Bangalore leads the, the race still even as of now. Now, followed by Hyderabad, which has caught up very well, followed by Gurgaon, then it's Pune, Mumbai, and Chennai. Now, these are predominantly the six areas in which, you know, the, the, this kind of uh, huge absorption by the large multinationals of, uh, is happening. Now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is a lot of great offices that are being produced in these cities are getting snapped up by these multinationals uh, as soon as they're ready. You know, you do not land up coming to those cities and saying, I want space. And, you know, it's available to you, you know, especially if you want bulk space, if you want space like in two lakh square feet, five lakh square feet, you don't get them in these cities easily. So what is happening is these large multinationals who are currently our clients, despite uh, from April, have not only paid us all 100% of our rents, have agreed to stay. And we also, as, a, as an own, our own organization, did about 24 lakh square feet of new leases, uh, that is from April till now. So there has been no loss of demand from these multinationals they're still coming in you know we've had clients like accenture scaling up space we've had clients like walmart taking huge amount of space from us you know all these companies are uh, coming into india uh, still despite uh, you know what the feeling is there on the pandemic 
in my view the pandemic yes has caused a, uh, a dent for a totally about 2% of the growth typically in india the you know the uh, cumulative absorption uh, incrementally was 8 to 9% per year in all these six cities uh, i would say it's dented by 1 or 2% for clients who have you know were maybe on uh, on the borderline not making too much money hope hanging in that you know to to this thing and so on the overall uh, national scale i would say there'll be a 2% drop because of that so the growth i would say i will put it to this year only down to 6 to 7% but i believe it's business as usual multinationals have to come where they have to develop this kind of business it has to be in countries like india where there is a lot of available manpower english speaking manpower english thinking manpower at a reasonable price so i believe corona will will be uh, you know a gone event by june and it will be business as usual around here thanks okay so yeah that's very interesting so you 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 uh, you are going to grow while the whole gdp goes negative your your sector is actually going to grow at 6% even in this uh, this time so that's a very positive uh, yeah. outlook uh, going forward but you know the last few years we've actually seen a new trend emerge which is a consolidation of demand by occupiers or you know moving to larger spaces in very good locations will this uh, trend change to occupiers being flexible and allowing employees to work in co-working spaces or how do you see the you know co-working space and this space evolving post pandemic so there are two themes which are emerging i think uh, first of all you must understand india uh, you know in all these six cities is considered a 1 dollar per square foot per month is uh, you know where the, the, the demand uh, is normally you know when when all these multinationals come the presentation made to them is that's how much it costs you for the real estate kind of space in this country and you must also understand the real estate is invariably in the suburban areas never in the prime city center areas you know the city center areas is left to a smaller um, a company which wants about 10000 square feet which doesn't mind paying the little extra to be in the city center otherwise if these bulk occupiers usually don't, there's no need for them to be since they they don't need to advertise who they are and what they do they just need to be in a place where their employees can get to work most easily so what has changed i would say in in covid i find that a lot of them are preferring to take satellite offices in and around the city to just make it more conducive for wherever you need to have human to human interaction on a personal basis they they take co working spaces we also have a brand called coworks and we find that companies have you know taken on and and renting out spaces and offices in and around the city just to make it more conducive for the people to get to uh, you know have meetings over there but on an overall basis there is no reduction in their th- those companies themselves taking space from us in fact earlier the co-working spaces was used for the overflow of the temp spaces they needed before they were allotted the large spaces in our parks because some of these companies need between 5 to 8 lakh square feet so by the time they recruit these few few thousands of people uh it it does take time so they used to take temp space from us but now those temp spaces are also being used to uh you know apart from training which is what was used for to also uh, accommodate them for these uh meetings uh, and we've we've also turned out products you know so it's more conducive for them to have meetings in different cities also in case they want to have a human to human face to face meeting so uh, it has changed a bit but honestly it's changed for the better i would say you know the change is always for the better so you know I- what i'm hearing literally is that not only is the commercial real estate space also growing but the co-working space in at least in india will will concomitantly grow and there's a huge opportunity there because you know that's the first step before they go into commercial space so if you if if the commercial space is growing at 6% what would you think that the co-working space would grow at um so uh, honestly uh, two things you know uh, uh, the, the, uh, one is uh, we also uh, uh, you know uh, i mean we, we did our co-working spaces uh, we had uh, an interest as you know from uh, uh, brookfield who bought in to our uh, part of a portfolio of our office space also showed keen interest on buying our co-working spaces because they felt that there's a lot of synergy like i just explained to you a minute ago of their uh, clients moving in and because we have uh, offices of coworks all across india they they found that there was a lot of synergy for a, for a see through i believe that the coworking will actually grow uh, much more than the standard office uh, by at least uh, close to 10% because of this uh, simple inherent uh, you know people are not necessarily making up their minds because uh, you know should we or should we not wait for the pandemic uh, pandemic to get over and take temporary space because in coworking as you know you can rent month on month whereas when you have to take a large commitment on office it has to be for between 5 to 8 years 
So I think from that point of view, co-working will do well for the short term. And it's here to stay. You know, that kind of business world over, as, as you've seen, uh, is caught on uh, quite well. And it's, it's very popular now for even small to medium offices. You know, a lot of them, as child accountants firms have seen a surrender the office because of the flexibility of getting hiring meeting rooms at different sizes within the co-working spaces so that they can, you know, cater to different clients during the day. So I think it's here to stay. There's no doubt on that. So, you know, so it's very interesting that, you know, you mentioned your deal, which you actually got in finance, but overall in the, in the real estate space or commercial estate space, you know, what is the availability of finance looking at and are people looking at funding uh, this uh, going forward? And, you know, many uh, countries have established the real, real estate investment trusts or the invits, uh, which are there. So what's the actual scenario uh, in India? Um, and, uh, you know, we have only two REITs, both focused on the commercial space. Do you see it uh, growing? Should we look at REITs and other asset classes? And how do you look at the, you know, the financing of this very critical part of our infrastructure going forward? So, uh, you know, uh, in terms of REITs, I believe that you will find that in 2021, there will be at least three new REITs uh, launched, making it a total of five, because I know they are in the anvil and they're going to happen soon. Uh, REITs is here to stay on the commercial uh, real estate front because they, it's, you know, offering a healthy yield of six to seven percent and plus an upside. And like I just explained, uh, if the growth of this business continues the way it's going, you know, it's just here to stay. So, you know, in commercial, it can just... REIT can be taken for granted. But you know, your, your larger question is, how does the REIT su substantiate itself in other asset classes uh, in, on the real estate side? You know, I would say the world's biggest REIT can actually come out of residential. But in India, as you know, the yields on residential are hardly two, two and a half percent. And unless the yield you know, moves up the marker to at least a 5% and beyond on, uh, you know, on investments, it's impossible for uh, a residential REIT to survive because uh, the expectation of an investor Who's, who's who's coming on the back of a return uh, needs that kind of a return to get going. So residential, no doubt, uh, be here, but I really highly doubt it can you know it can make the difference unless the yields start going up. So I feel uh, there's a huge opportunity, but here there's a challenge in front of us on those asset classes. Yes, you will find uh, you know uh, this thing coming in uh, other asset classes like you know in, in warehousing. You will find the rate of warehousing. You will find all those assets will slowly you know uh, come to roost very soon. But I believe that residential, which is the biggest, will, will be the last and may not even be there a chance to be there because of what it is. I'm very conscious that you're not in the residential and other real estate space, but uh, just to follow on, are there, uh, you know, um, it was an oversupply state. Is that why the returns are low or, you know, uh, why are the returns low and, you know, how is the residential uh, kind of space playing? Because, you know, we hear that in Mumbai, they reduced the stamp duty and we had a flood of uh, sales and registrations uh, going forward. So, you know, would we have to rejig our business models or what will we have to do in the real estate space to, uh, you know, get to a 5% return like you talked about? So there are two, two three things. Uh, One is I find that, you know, uh, first of all, no doubt what Maharashtra did on reducing stamp duty, I think all uh, states should uh, use that as an opportunity because if you need uh, money, because right now because of the pandemic, a lot of money was spent in, you know, uh, in supporting the the state because of the loss of exchequer. But I think they need to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, just reduce stamp duty and get going for the next few months to collect lots of money. But beyond that, I think your question is what does uh, why does a, a residential always give a lower return? Because somewhere at the back of the mind, you know, residential is considered as a safety net. So what is happening is and uh, residential has inherently, you know, if you look at uh, over a, a time span of a decade, has always given you good returns. So actually uh, people buy it for just the safety net and the, uh, and the appreciation. And if the return is even two to a half percent, they're okay with it. So really it's not taken so much from a absolute asset class which needs to give a return because in an office, it has no other application. Of course, other than if you take an office for yourself, but in terms of bulk offices, like if you take a few lakhs of square feet, you are doing it only with a pure, uh, pure business in mind. Residential has a different flavor. You sometimes buy it for your family, you buy it for your children, you know, so on, and then just let it rent it out. So you're really not do too pushy on what the expectations are because appreciation pays for itself. So actually, if you look at it an overall scale uh, over 10 years, you know, you'll find that it doubles and triples in, in, a, in a scale of 10 years. 
but uh, in, in terms of REIT, REIT has to give absolute returns in in a cash on cash basis and not so much on appreciation. Uh, I know that's the finance part of it, but if I were to say, you know, in 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 you know, you're not in the real estate and in the in the residential real estate space, but if you had, uh, uh, you know, how is this going to change uh, going forward, or you know, what are the things that the developers there need to do differently, uh, if at all? Would there be a reconfiguration of models? Just your thoughts. I mean, I know you're not in that space, but just to you know, the wholeness of getting the whole uh, view from both sides. So, so you know, just as a perspective, you know, I have, I have always been a believer that the affordable housing, which the government also wants to give a big push, wants to make housing for all, you know, a, sh a shelter for all, is actually a 20-year program. So I've been, when I, when, I, when I go abroad, a lot of developers say, where does the residential opportunity lie? And to my mind, it clearly lies if you can make and churn out, you know, uh, apartments by the thousands or by the lakhs per year and, you know, make it affordable, high quality, you know, uh, just uh, do, do quick deliveries. You can keep being in this business, like I said, for 20 years and have nothing else to do because the government is giving a good push on the other side of reducing interest rates, making it more affordable, giving GST benefits, doing every kind of benefit they can to make it affordable. And, and the demand is unsatiable. You can just go on and on. So, you know, residential is actually a good play if someone knows how to do it. Okay, so, the, the, you know, I mean, while you have mentioned some of this in your, in your uh, response now, but if you were to look at both commercial and the, the whole real estate sector, uh, you know, what are the two or three things, uh, you know, that the government could do to actually increase this growth and even go to double digit growth? Because unless we get double digit growth in this sector, you know, the economy is not going to grow. So what are the two or three things you feel that... Uh, the government should be looking at and uh, doing, you know, at the center in the states. So, you know, first of all, what I'm observing, I speak to a lot of my uh, residents, uh, residents, developer friends, they're actually seeing that some, some of them have actually, you know, come back to the numbers of sales uh, to what was happening uh, pre-COVID. So, you know, the, the feel good is already getting back in place. But I think from an overall short term basis, the governments have to be, uh, uh, you know, allowing pe uh, people to get back to work. Now, by giving the confidence that you know that things are okay on the ground, of course, when they are okay on the ground, and secondly, allowing the international flights because a lot of multinationals who are coming in, a lot of those employees who were, were working in India are not allowed to come back yet uh, into India to work, or you know the fear is not yet behind them. So once that goes in the short term, but I believe that you know the amount of push the state has to give, like a state government also should you know consider doing something. Uh, on the front of you know, affordable housing, which I believe is where the ma maximum amount of sales can happen. And like you said, the double digit growth can come is by reducing stamp duty, by, by giving a single window agency, which you know, everybody's been screaming that us give us single window clearance and let us get going in the project. Because sometimes the projects simply take one and a half, two years to get going. And a lot of loss of interest keeps happening on the, on the cost of investment made till then. And I find that it's very sad that that, that money actually is going to some institution or bank and those benefits cannot be passed on to the customers. So somewhere to help them expedite, uh, to be you know, quick about completing these projects, the government has to seriously consider that. And I think that, can, that saving can be passed on to the customers. You know, it's very interesting. When you started the conversation, you, you actually uh, shared that how you spotted an opportunity in Bangalore many, many years ago. And you know, a lot of people feel Bangalore and Gurgaon and you know, Pune, these are kind of got uh, saturated. Uh, what is you know can we replicate this in other tier two or tier three cities in India and what will it take to develop a Bangalore, Pune, or a you know uh, or a Gurgaon in 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 those areas? Because I think if in if these three cities could be the back office of the world, literally, I mean rural India or other parts of India could be the back office of India. So what would it take to actually develop that? And how do we can we light the you know, ambition in people such as you who looked at Bangalore first to look at these tier two and tier three cities? So I think, you know, I'll put the, the, the answer a little differently. What I am observing is the youth in India uh, wanting the lifestyle cities because once they are able to get a job, apart from, you know, they're, compelling, uh, they're compelled to stay uh, in and around their home for whatever family reasons, but if they have the you know, wings to fly around the country, they are preferring cities which offer them the lifestyle for an affordable price and, and, a, and a clean environment. And Bangalore, having uh, I said that, whether it's Bangalore, Pune, 
and Gurgaon offers that lifestyle. You know, so I'll give you a, 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 a recollection of what I remember where Narayan Murthy, when he was the chairman of Infosys, you know, he made a statement that uh, despite Infosys having offices uh, all over the, uh, the country, my maximum amount of job, job applications come for Bangalore City. So that simply goes to show that, you know, the person coming, say, from Bihar who's got this qualification is again putting his job application uh, into Bangalore and does not want to hang around in, in and around in any of those, uh, in, in the closest vicinity, but just wants to come to Bangalore because it offers a lifestyle, you know, it, uh, it, it gives him the opportunity. In fact, now because the number of venture capital companies that have already come into Bangalore, so if he wants to branch off into starting something of his own because, you know, he has this, uh, the skills to invent something, he, he knows Bangalore can offer, you know, the funding for it in terms of since there's so many of these you know, uh, uh, institutions which uh, want to fund startups. So, you know, these uh, all that ecosystem has landed about in all these cities. So, you know, it will become very difficult to replicate. And secondly, you know, when you look at all these multinationals, you know, the ease of these multinationals coming, flying in and out to take decisions on locations, uh, even a Pune gets challenged more often than not because they have to fly into Mumbai and, and drive for three, four hours to to Pune. So, you know, Bangalore scores completely over everything else. That's why if you, if you as you know, I would say somewhere uh, last uh, uh, year, Bangalore became the number three uh, city in India in terms of uh, number of passenger traffic in, in a particular month. That simply comes from the fact that everybody is just coming here for business, of course, because Bangalore is not a tourist place, no doubt. It's only for work and, you know, for whatever uh, else. So, it obviously is scoring very high. And if you ask me, Bangalore was at number five. So jumping from number five to number three, and you know it may cut through to even at number two. It only comes from the fact that it has become a you know as as you know if if you lose a job in in the U.S. as a joke goes, they say you've been bangalore. So Bangalore has become like a word you know it's become a, you know it's on your lips now when it comes to anything to do with an outsourcing or job into into India. So you know it's going to be hard to replicate it if that's your question. Uh, because it's not the money. Because when I, when, if you even you take it 100 square feet per person because of COVID, you know, you give more. The cost per employee per seat in Bangalore is 7,500 rupees at, you know, at one dollar per square foot. It's not all that much now. for for somebody to move to say a smaller town like a Mysore and do it for 6,000 rupees. A saving of 1,500 rupees is not going to get the employee to move into that city because the employee will still want to work in Bangalore. So your attrition will be very high. Getting employees will be very high. You know, and, and like see, like I use the Infosys example, and Infosys to fill its facilities in Mysore is finding it challenging, uh, but in Bangalore, it, you know, it can get the employees it wants. So it's it's a question of where people are willing to work. So thank you. I think you know uh, the the message there is that if you have to replicate Bangalore, you have to start right from the beginning. You know, you have to get the healthcare, you got to get the entertainment, you got to get the shopping, you got to get the ecosystem going, and then you know that that. Uh, 7,000 to 6,000 uh, kind of difference might make uh, might make it valuable uh, there. So you know, I think it's been a very fascinating uh, conversation. Uh, you you know, you, you talked about the six percent growth. You talked about you know the, the, the residential also picking up. And if we you know, and if, if the lockdown, I mean, if the unlock continues to put unlock and international uh, passenger passengers start arriving, you might actually see more growth. And of course, thank you for your suggestions for. Uh, the government uh, that you had made, uh, the state governments reducing stamp duty, and I think your focus on the uh, low-cost housing, uh, which is there. Um, so I think we've we've covered a lot of ground here. Thank you for your, you know being so you know so very clear and succinct in your in your communication, uh, and I'm sure the viewers here would have enjoyed every minute. Thank you very much uh, for that, and we look forward uh, to your continued growth and may you have you know, a faster growth going ahead. So thank you very much for being with us today. Thanks, Dilip. Thanks, Vicky.